So I'm Simi Shamatetic and I will talk about today about uh, the joint project between ETH Zurich and Cornell Tech with my colleagues Mansoor Ahmed, Kari Kostianin, Aritra Dar, David Sommer, Arthur Gervais and Sergeant Chapman from ETH and Ari Jules from Cornell Tech. So uh, I just wanted to mention that this work has nothing to do with software integrity as this session says so. So it's a bit uh, off the topic if somebody wanted to listen about software integrity. This is more about system security, embedded security, trusted execution environments, uh, integrity protection in general, data, not software. But so let's start. Um, just a second. OK. So basically, uh, here, the under trusted execution environments, we actually uh, did test on Intel Software Guard extensions, even though it was one of the keywords that was in most of the rejected papers. I guess this one came in with this keyword. Uh, so what is SGX? Uh, SGX is the Intel's new architecture uh, from the sixth generation processor available that actually contains a new instruction set and protecting mechanisms in the processor. Uh, I mean, regular systems that we all use today, because SGX is not yet well, uh, came inside of the applications. Uh, we have a normal stack where we have a hardware, we have an OS, and we have the applications running on top of that. And we presume that the attacker sits uh, on the OS and on the applications, and the hardware is secure. Uh, but the problem is that if there's a malicious application, if there's a malicious code in the application, uh, this can ruin everything. So the point of the Intel SGX is that you can have an isolated execution of some code where you can run some uh, security critical operations. But let me tell you a bit more in a graphical way what it is. So an SGX application is consisted of uh, an untrusted application, like a normal application, which you would do in any programming language, and a trusted component uh, enclave, which is run in isolation. So how it actually works is, you can see it on here. So the normal flow of the program works as follows. You have an untrusted part that does something. The, if needed, the enclave is created. The process which is to the isolated execution space finishes, returns some value, and then continues out in front. Uh, so basically, what, this SGX, what does the SGX give us in terms of application security? So one of the most important features is sealing. So what is actually sealing? That means storing data for persistent storage across execution, so across reboots. Uh, and this gives us confidentiality and authentication. But the question is, what about the integrity of that data that is stored across executions? Another thing uh, available with SGX is that the processors are equipped with cryptographic keys, which enables us to perform uh, remotely verifiable attestation, uh, which can prove that a certain machine, a certain processor, is running the exact code that it says it's running. So in this graphic here, you can see a model uh, basically what SGX has available and what it doesn't have available. So it runs uh, inside of the processor, the Enclave runs. So Enclave has no secure storage. It has no access to the peripherals, no notion of time. Uh, the only thing that it has access, secure access to is the memory. So the memory is protected because it's encrypted. But anything that goes outside of the processor boundary is not. So SGX Enclaves don't have uh, network access, uh, so they have to communicate to other parties through an untrusted uh, OS network and so forth. So to recap a little bit the pluses and the minuses of this new architecture. So as a plus, I would say it isolates execution, and this helps us when we have an untrusted OS. Another thing is that you can run many enclaves in parallel uh, as much as you want, as the memory allows you. It supports attestation, so you can verify that the exact code is running, which you're supposed that is. It supports sealing, and what we said sealing is actually storing encrypted data blobs on, onto the disk. And unlike with TPMs, the security boundary remains inside of the processor, which means that we are not leaving 
the processor. The problems with it, the minuses, is that it's not system-wide. So it's not like trust zone. It's very limited in that sense. There's no direct access to peripherals. Uh, so if you connect a USB stick, there's no way to securely communicate between the enclave and the USB because the buses are not, the data that goes through the buses are not encrypted. And what many recent works have shown that currently is susceptible to side channel attacks. The last thing here, and this is actually the, the topic of this presentation, is that it doesn't protect you against a rollback attack. And now I'll explain a bit more an example what a rollback attack is. So on one machine, you have an enclave and you have the OS that want to do some business. So the target and the enclave says to the OS, could you please store message one for me? And the OS says, sure, why not? I've stored message one for you. After some time, the enclave have, has done some computation and it has a new data set and it says, okay, now I want to update my state. Please store message two for me. And the OS says, no problem, the message two is stored. But then an enclave is restarted. The machine is shut down, rebooted, or it suffers from some kind of amnesia. It reboots and now asks the OS, hey, could you please give me the latest message? And a malicious OS, what it would do, an adversary would say, sure, here's message one. <clears throat> so that's a problem, because there is no way actually to detect that message one was not the latest message. Message one was encrypted and authenticated by the enclave, and the enclave can decrypt it without any problems, but it doesn't know if it was the latest one or some previous state that it stored before. Uh, as, sent, as said already, so a robot attack, a malicious OS can replace the latest sealed data with an older encrypted and authenticated version. Uh, there's also another way to violate state integrity inside of the SGX, and it's actually if you run two instances of the same enclave at the same time. So there are currently no mechanisms to detect if multiple instances of the same enclave are running on the processor. Enclaves themselves cannot detect replay, <clears throat> because the processor does not hold the persistent state across enclave execution. That means the processor has no knowledge about previous executions after it's restarted, rebooted, or it loses power. So let me show you now an example scenario where this actually can perform a, be a big problem. So imagine a financial application where uh, the account balance is enforced by the SGX and everything is run inside of the enclave. So the initial bank account balance is 300. So a user sends 100, an attacker who has an account balance with 300 sends one user 100. After that, it sends another user 200. And of course, the account balance is now zero. But what it now does, it restarts and forces the OS to replay an old state. And voila. 300 is back on the account balance. And the user sends to the, and the attacker sends to the fourth user another 100. So you can see the point of what is the problem here. You can indefinitely spend uh, money, okay, this, in this application scenario. There are many more, but this is something that we focused on. So after this a bit longer introduction, uh, I'm going to state the main contributions of this work. So what we did is that we created a new security model uh, for reasoning about the integrity and freshness of SGX applications, um, alongside identifying the security weaknesses in, in existing SGX systems. Um, SGX architecture itself has monotonic counters, uh, which might be used to protect state, but we did experiments showing the limitations of, it, of the service. We create the novel approach of realizing rollback protection by storing these counters in a distributed system. We implemented Road as a system and uh, made it as a library, so to ensure integrity and freshness of uh, application data uh, against a powerful adversary model, which I'm going to talk a bit later about, and did an experimental evaluation of the system and showed actually that the, the overhead uh, that we had is only one to two milliseconds in a low latency network. 
So now a little bit about the counters. Um, how can we actually solve the problem of the rollback? So if an enclave wants to store a message n, it also stores alongside the message n, it stores a counter value, a monotonically increasing counter value. But it doesn't only store it in an OS, but imagine that we have an abstraction of some protected space. It's somewhere in the cloud. Don't think about where it is currently, but it's just protected. It's secure, it's protected, and it's always going to give you what you gave it the last. If we send both of these messages here, and then suffer from the same amnesia that we suffered before, now, when we ask for what was my latest message, the OS is going to return message X and X as a counter. And also, we're going to ask the protected space to return the latest counter. So what happens here is that the, the enclave can then verify, is X equal to N? If it is, then it can securely load the state that it saved before. If it's not, it's going to discard it. So to solve this problem, there are some existing solutions. So the, the, the two basic approaches that you can find in, in, in the literature are to use a non-volatile memory element to store the state. But these non-volatile memory elements usually have limitations. They can be slow. Uh, they can wear out. Uh, and they sit outside of the processor boundary. And the other thing is to maintain integrity information in a separate trusted server. Like I said, some protected space outside. But then it's a problem, it's a, it's a one point of failure, and then we actually forward the trust to some third entity, which might or might not in the long run be trusted. SGX itself uh, supports monotonic counter service, as they call it, which actually prevents rollback, but it's limited. It has limited security guarantees, and I'm going to talk about it, and it has very poor, poor performance. And the third solution, uh, widely known is like leveraging trusted platform modules, but the limitations about that are similar, and then TPMs are small. Uh, as I said, SGX supports monotonic counter service. They are stored in, in, in the off CPU memory, so they're not residing in the, in the processor itself. Uh, and the problem with these monotonic counter service, and this was not explained in the Intel documentation, is that this counter are probably stored in the flash memory of the BIOS. Uh, and the problem with that is that this memory is connected to the processor, to, a to the platform control hub, and the SPI bus, uh, which is a, actually a slow and passive component. So there is no encryption done uh, on these counters traversing to this memory, uh, nor, nor any computations. Uh, so. The, the, the performance, sorry, so the performance of this is, is also critical. So one counter increment uh, operation takes from around 80 to 250 milliseconds. Uh, this de really depends on the laptop manufacturer and the equipment that we tested, and we did test really a lot. Uh, to read a counter from this memory, it took us 60 to 140 milliseconds, again, depending on the, on the model. We found out also that after one, around one million writes in, in, in all of these devices, uh, the non-volatile memory wears out. So the counter service of SGX just stops working, and it doesn't work anymore. You can't read, you can't uh, increment counters, nothing. So the machine, basically, if you want to use this counter, the machine is useless. You can throw it away. You need a new one. Another problematic thing is that if you reinstall the software that Intel gives you in order to run SGX on your machine uh, or remove the BIOS battery, you actually delete all of the counters. So all of the memory that was saved inside is lost. And in the end, the updates that take up to 200 milliseconds, so Basically, the counters, if, if you do it consecutively, the counters become unusable in a few days. Even if you would do one increment per minute, that leaves your machine useless in about two years. So a little bit about our system and attacker model. So what we really wanted to do here is create a very strong attacker with a lot of capabilities. So basically, we allow the attacker to do enclave scheduling platform reboots. The attacker controls the full software stack. 
He has the complete uh, control over the communication channel network, like a Dolly Viao attacker. And we also introduced the attacker that he has the capability of compromising the SGX hardware, but in a limited uh, manner. So the property that we got here is that uh, an attacker can achieve what we call an all or nothing rollback. So basically, in our, in our distributed system, the only way to violate data integrity would be to reset the entire group uh, to its initial state. But let me talk about it a little bit later. So now I'm going to present you the basic approach that we used to actually solve this problem. So the basic intuition that led us to this uh, solution is that when, when we checked all of these things, uh, we figured out that a single platform cannot efficiently prevent rollback, uh, rollback attacks. Basically, with SGX, it works like that. But in many other practical scenarios, multiple processor can help each other to achieve uh, this property. So we have one SGX node. And now, let's say we have a group of six. So what we do here is that we try to build a distributed system where each participating node provides state protection for all the other nodes. Uh, they all communicate between each other in a one-to-one -one fashion and uh, exchange these monotonic counters in order to uh, uh, protect their state. So how it actually works, let's see an example of one. Uh, so when one enclave wants to update its state, it saves the state locally to the disk and sends a counter to each other participating node in the group. These nodes save the counter, the, en the enclaves save the counter, and when the enclave needs to recover its state, it of course first loads the, the, the state from the disk and asks all the other participating nodes to retrieve the, the, the counter and then compare. So all the other nodes will retrieve the counter the SGX node will check the counter, and this verifies that the latest state it saved is state one. It's gonna check, compare the, the state loaded from the disk with the counter, and if it's okay, um, it's gonna accept it. So there were some challenges alongside this work that we had. Uh, the first one is obviously that we, in the beginning, set a very strong attacker model, um, and it wasn't, it wasn't easy to create a system that can protect against uh, this. The other thing is network partitioning. So in any distributed system, and if you also have an attacker that uh, controls the communication channel, the attacker can perform partitioning of the network and allow you to communicate only with a part of nodes from the group. So we had to figure out what's the minimum number of nodes that are available in order for this system to work. The third one is coordinated enclave restarts. So even though it, it, wasn't, it didn't seem like a problem uh, in the beginning, but if an attacker coordinate, has a coordinated enclave restart in specific parts of the protocol, he can uh, influence the protocol outline and, and then inside in, inject and actually perform a rollback. We solved it uh, by adding, adding uh, another round to the protocol. Another one is multiple enclave instances. So there, there was no way to distinguish between two instances that are running uh, on the same processor of the same enclave because they, they have the same code. That means that they have the same measurement. Um, and the last one was the group establishment. So in order to establish the group between these nodes, they have to share some information about each other in order to do so. Uh, okay. Now a little bit about the system architecture. So basically we used Road uh, as a system service and then we introduced something called the application specific enclave that can be any enclave created by any developer of any application that actually needs this as a service. It needs counter service, it needs state protection. So our system service with a rollback enclave it actually implements the road library that these application-specific enclaves use. Uh, this design choice, of course, it can be done either way. We use this design choice in order to 
hide all the maintenance and all the distribution of the counter from the applications itself. So the, actually the system service is available for usage for anybody who wants to use it. So there, there's no need to implement anything additionally. So this is the this is the sketch of the system. On a platform, you can have multiple, well, actually, you can show a little bit here. You can have multiple application-specific enclaves uh, that run some any application uh, that they need. They implement the, the road library here. They use the road library. And there is a system service in form of a rollback enclave, which actually does the work for them. In order to do so, we needed to create three different protocols. So application uh, enclave state update protocol, rollback enclave restart protocol, and the ASA start read protocol. There's not enough time here, so I'm going to just explain one of them um, to give you an intuition of how this is done. So basically, if an application-specific uh, enclave wants to update its own state, it will try to increment the counter between itself and the rollback enclave. The rollback enclave is going to update its internal state, which actually means that the rollback enclave has to start communicating with the other nodes in the group. And it's, it does it by incrementing its in, uh, own internal monotonic counter, signing it, and sending it to the other nodes. The other nodes, after receiving the counter, reply with an echo message. The target in initial rollback enclave verifies the echoes and then does another round of the returned echoes. And this is actually the round that I mentioned before to protect for the co from the coordinated enclave restarts. And then all the other rollback enclaves respond with a final acknowledgment. After the final acknowledgments have been um, verified, the rollback enclave can save its own state. Uh, and confirm to the application-specific enclave that its, all, that its state is secure. So how we did the security analysis? So basically, we split it into two parts. The first part actually follows the intuition, what I told you before. So if we would have a protected space, uh, some kind of secure storage functionality, which is in this case abstracted, the rollback enclave could verify that its state is the latest and that the rollback is prevented. So basically, we created a model um, and tried all of, the, all of the cases and all of the paths and proved that if we would have uh, a, a protected space like that, we could protect against rollback. So the second part of the security analysis that we did is actually the realization of this abstraction of protected space, and this is what we did as a distributed system. So there were three main things that we had to do there. We had to check about the quorum size, and this is the thing that I talked about, network partitioning. We had to deal with platform restarts, and we had to deal with multiple enclave instances in form of forking attacks. Unfortunately, as I see that I'm speaking now over, over 20 minutes, there's not enough time for me to explain how this actually works. Uh, but I'm glad to do it later on or uh, point you out to the details in the paper. The last thing I want to talk about is the performance evaluation. So we did experimental uh, analysis of the state update and the state retrieval or read delay. And we have the following. So we did first uh, a performance analysis for a small group within a local area network of only two to four nodes. Um, and we can actually see here that the response time is around two, two milliseconds. And this actually includes networking, which actually means that the overhead of the road system is meaningless. It, it's the only overhead of actually the network from one enclave to another. Then we did a test of geographically distributed protection groups. So basically, we instantiated uh, Amazon uh, instances, one in the US, one in Europe, one in Asia, one in Africa, I mean, wherever. Uh, so from two to six nodes. And here you can actually see that the timing um, increases. Why? Because, I mean, if you just ping a server on another continent, it's going to take you 300 milliseconds uh, for one round trip. We have two round trips here, which actually accounts for something 
like 600 milliseconds. Of course, it decreases if all of the nodes have to communicate with each other across continents. And the third one, we did a simulated performance for a larger group uh, within the local network. Um, so the simulated Im implementation actually means that there was no SGX processing inside, uh, but the SGX processing, what we had inside is fixed. So we could have, we could do it even on a simulated implementation which doesn't have SGX. So you can see that if we have up to 20 nodes, uh, of course, the response time for an update and response time for a read increases because the node that is doing the update and that is doing the read actually has uh, to contact more nodes and wait for more responses. <clears throat> Another performance evaluation that we did is that we actually made kind of a three cases um, on a simulated application, a financial application, where you actually have a state that has some size so what do you need to store it and, and, and read it? And we actually compare this with uh, solutions that have no rollback protection. We compared it to our system and we compared it to the SGX counters available from Intel. So let's say we are writing a state of 10 kilobytes um, on the disk and also we have to distribute the monotonic counter. With no rollback protection, this would take us around 4.6 milliseconds. If we have road system on, and this is actually done on tests with four nodes, just to mention, it would take us six milliseconds. And if we would do it only on one machine locally and try to protect it against rollback, it would take us 162 milliseconds. So this is two order, almost two orders of magnitude uh, better results than what is actually supported by the Intel themselves and for the read as well. So we have 1.76 milliseconds for no rollback protection, 3.1 with road, and then 60, around 63 without uh, road, but with SGX counters. So some lessons learned. Uh, the current SGX, of course, this, this was not intended to be a project. We started this as a small idea that we needed to solve in order to do a bigger thing. And then we figured out this is a complete project that several people have been working on for a while. Uh, there are a lot of things that could be addressed uh, inside of the architecture that would definitely strengthen the position of this uh, furthermore. Uh, what we found out that, well, at least I did, that designing a distributed system is, well, which is both efficient and does everything that we required from a security point of view, is really a challenge. I'm not, I plan to move away from that area. Uh, and of course, it was very difficult because alongside our work, we found out a lot of attack vectors after we were digging more deep and deep into the architecture, we were finding new attack vectors. And that's why it took us a long time after we finally, you know, uh, settled and, 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 and proven to, uh, to ourselves that there's no more attacks on this particular thing. Uh, lastly, de developing enclaves is still a bit buggy, cumbersome, and it takes really a lot of time and patience um, to actually do some meaningful work. And to conclude, uh, this slide I had already before. So basically, the contributions here were the new security model, that the reason about integrity and freshness, the SGX counter experiments, which were never done before to show its limitations, uh, a novel approach of realizing rollback through a distributed system. We implemented and tested road, uh, and our evaluation actually showed that the overhead is low. So, thank you. Ari Feldman, uh, University of Chicago. Uh, it's a nice talk. Um, apropos of the uh, Mickens reference, um, uh, what's the relationship of, of the, the, this protocol to, let's say, doing BFT among the among the nodes in so, terms of quorum size performance, or exactly, is this actually BFT? Exactly. Very good question. I skipped it because I didn't have enough time of that. But there's a there's a long section in the paper that actually compares 
the current Byzantine fault tolerant protocols with this one. So basically, in a Byzantine fault tolerant, you have something like 2F plus 1, 3F plus 1 uh, dependency of the quorum size. What we managed to do here is F plus 1, being F as the number of nodes that have uh, a compromised SGX. Of course, we introduced another uh, thing that is called unavailable nodes. So these nodes don't have a compromised SGX, but they can be malicious in a sense that the OS might not forward the network traffic. So this is basically the quorum size is, 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 is a bit over 50% of the group, of course, because if you don't have 50% of the group, then you can do network partitioning. Yeah, thanks. Very cool work. Um, so let, let's say you're Intel uh, and you want to fix some of the shortcomings that you've identified. So what would you suggest to them? Is it enough to kind of fix the performance and uh, you know maybe move the storage inside the processor boundary or would you recommend something different? I mean, it would be ideal if we have a storage in the processor that can actually store counters. That would be the most ideal solution. But that's never going to happen because that would be extremely expensive to put uh, non-volatile memory on the processor chip. So this is something that we might not see. Uh, what Intel plans to do, I really don't know, but they have contacted us and they want to talk about it, uh, of what we, um, what we suggest to them and to, to do some, uh, some work together. Let's see. Uh, but the current thing is actually not good. As I said, these counters that the Intel has are outside of the memory. And with these tests, we actually, we, we've actually proven that they are not secure for a physical attacker that uh, can tap the slow bus with a, a bit more expensive oscilloscope. This is uh, more for some clarification on the slide where you were talking exactly about that on the limitations of the non-volatile memory that's used to uh, store the monotone, uh, uh, the monotone counter. So I think you said that if you were to reinstall SGX, yeah, that, that's the bullet point. This one? Uh, yeah, it will reset the counter. Yeah. Or to zero, meaning you can roll No, back. no, it, it completely deletes everything uh, from that memory. So, for example, if you had a counter with uh, identifier 10 and you reinstall the SGX on the system or remove the battery, right. and then you go inside of the Enclave application and you want to retrieve counter with the same identifier, it's going to show you an error. That counter does not exist anymore. So it doesn't reset it, it deletes it. All right, so how does it detect the old counters? So basically how it actually works, so you create yeah. a counter, yeah. It gets its own identifier. You increment it, store it there. But then the identifier you need to save. You save it in this encrypted sealed data. So you just save it on the disk. When you get it from the I disk see. back, you can see, you can check the counter. If you lose the identifier, you lose the counter. But Thank you. Yeah. yeah. OK, let's thank the speakers one more time. Uh, so uh, Feng Wei Zhang from Wednesday. So I think a uh, uh, cool work. So basically, your proposal is to use a, a distributed solution to uh, solve the counter problem. Yeah. And we also can see the SGX that have some local counter. Also can, but we can see the drawback is performance is to use SPI a protocol is very slow, right? So in terms of local solutions, do you think? Um, I mean, we know the drawbacks. Do you think those, those kind of local solutions they have uh, any advantages compared to the distributed solutions? I mean, of course, uh, a local solution has the advantage of you don't have to be connected to the internet. You don't have to deal with network traffic, network latencies, and so forth. So in that terms, yes. But there is still no decent enough local solution that works. Of course, you can also do it with a TPM. But I'm, I'm, imagine an application where it needs to update the state every second. You can't do it, or every millisecond. Some, imagine a stock market, and you're doing fast transactions. They happen. God knows how many per second. And you have to update the state after each of every one of them. So there is no solution that can actually give you the properties to be that fast and that it has an indefinite uh, incremental capability. So I can increment until billions, trillions, and here I'll wear out any non-volatile memory that you put. I can wear it out very quickly. OK, after that false alarm, let's thank the speakers one more time. And we're now on a break.